Yeah, okay. Good afternoon. Good evening. Um, very warm welcome to everybody here and also everybody joining us via the live stream. I'm looking at the camera there. Um, I'm Shiro Lim. I'm a historian based at Aarhus University in Denmark and I'll be your chair for today's launch of Devin Vartier's book, The Color of Equality, Race and Common Humanity in Enlightenment Thought. It's good to see so many of you here uh, in person and in what for, you know, pandemic situations is, is a total full house sold out situation. I remember very distinctly when I went to a kind of inaugural professorial lecture some years ago for a very famous historian. Uh, the lecture hall was packed, packed really, people sitting on the stairs everywhere, total fire hazard. And um, this famous historian looked, took a look at the crowd and remarked, you know, wow, you know, so, so, he's so delighted that there's so many people that turned up and he observed that the atmosphere was so electric, it was somewhere between a birthday party and a public execution. <laughs> and I think a book launch actually is not so far over from that. But I think, I also think that we all agree which side of that divide we want today's event to be on. Uh, indeed, we're here to celebrate a great achievement in the shape of this book, which I'm sure you've all bought and brought here with you to get autographed. Um, if not, I think you can get a discount somewhere. Um, there's a card with a QR code that you should definitely obtain if you haven't already gotten the book. Before we begin proper, let me tell you um, how we plan to proceed. So first, I'll have a little chat with Devin to get him to tell us more about the book. Um, second, we'll hear from our three distinguished commentators, whom I will introduce in a minute. Um, third, we'll be taking questions from you. Um, I'm afraid, yeah, I have to apologize to the, the audience joining us via live stream. I don't, we don't have capacity to take questions from our online audience, so you'll have to hold your peace for now, I'm afraid. Um, fourth and finally, we'll be reconvening, I think, over there for uh, a little festive drink. And that's where I imagine you can get Devin to sign your book. Um, now, very importantly, I'd like to introduce our three discussants. It's with great pleasure and esteem that I would like to welcome Ahmad Msharik, Alicia Montoya, and Silvia Sebastiani. So I'll go in, order, um, in, in the order in which they will be speaking. So Silvia first. Silvia is professor at the, uh, uh, the Ecole des Institutes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. She's an authority on the Scottish Enlightenment, and her research examines questions of race, gender, animality, and history writing in the early modern and modern periods. Her current work explores how Enlightenment thinkers conceived of the boundaries between man and ape, between humanization and dehumanization. Um, Alicia Montoya, Alicia, if you give, give a little wave, um, is professor of French literature and culture at Radboud University in Nijmegen. She is a specialist on the 18th century and currently leads a project on the dissemination of ideas and the circulation of books in Europe in the period between 1665 and 1830. It's a study that encompasses several hundred private library auction catalogues using book history data and digital tools to give us a fresh perspective on the European Enlightenment. Finally, we have Amar Msharek, who is Professor of Anthropology of Science at the University of Amsterdam. Her research interests are in forensics, forensic anthropology, and race. She has presided over several major projects exploring various aspects of these themes, notably Race Face ID, a project seeking to illuminate the ways in which race is shaped as a set of relations between the biological, the social, and the technical. So thank you, all three of you, for being here. And like everybody else, I'm sure I'm very much looking forward to um, listening to you in a very short while. There's one person I've yet to introduce, and that is the author of the book we are here to discuss. Um, Devin is Assistant Professor of History at Utrecht University, as well as Fellow at the École uh, des Institutes en Sciences Sociales in Paris. He took his bachelor's degree from McMaster University in Hamilton, Canada, and his research master's and doctoral degrees from Utrecht University. His doctoral research on the interplay between race and equality in the Enlightenment has culminated in this wonderful book, The Color of Equality, Race, and common humanity in enlightenment thought, about which I am very excited to talk about Devin right now. And I'm sure Devin is as well, because he's already in the hot seat. So <laughs> let's begin. <laughs> so Devin, tell us, before we actually get to the material of the book, yes. uh, through you know, the 18th century, can you tell us maybe, can we journey through your mind a little bit? How did you get to this project? How did you conceive it? Tell us more about your research and 
the background. Sure, sure. Uh, well, my interest in the Enlightenment, I think, started uh, during my bachelor degree uh, when, uh, uh, as you mentioned, I was at McMaster University and I took an interdisciplinary program, uh, Arts and Science, and we had uh, two mandatory courses, uh, Modern Western Civilization, and, or sorry, Western Civilization and uh, Modern Western Thought. Um, and in a very, as you can tell from the titles, it's fairly old school uh, style. And in, in those courses, they referred to the Enlightenment as the age of reason. And um, of course, I would never use that term uh, nowadays, but I think at, at the time, I was fascinated by the idea that a society or a culture could transition from irrationality to rationality. And of course, in the course of my education, I realized that it's a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting than that. Um, but that sort of really just captured my imagination as a bachelor student. Um, uh, and then um, more specifically for this project, uh, 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 the origins of this project uh, are in my master's degree uh, when uh, at Utrecht University, and uh, I had just come from Canada, you know, uh, uh, fairly nervous at Utrecht University, and um, I was looking for uh, a, a person to uh, supervise a, a, a master's tutorial, I believe. And my wonderful uh, tutorial advisor or mentor, Wilhelm Ruberg, who's here, she uh, uh, connected me up with Siep Sturman, who is a professor uh, uh, emeritus at Utrecht University, uh, and who he had presented his uh, work in a beautifully eloquent and and cogent lecture uh, in one of the courses I was taking on equality and inequality and enlightenment thought. And it was just, as soon as he uh, finished, I was like, that's it. That's something that I uh, want to know more about, about this vexed uh, and contradictory legacy of the Enlightenment. So uh, that's kind of how, and then that turned into my master's thesis, which turned into my doctoral dis dissertation which resulted in this book. So that's kind of how, how it went. <laughs> wow, yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of us have an inspirational mentor story as well, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so I mean, yeah, you talked about how you learned, you know, you learned that people called the Enlightenment the age of reason and things, and now, you know, it's more complicated than that, right? So, but in some kind of crude way, all history books could be summarized as, the argument of all history books could be summarized as it's more complicated than that. Right? <laughs> so which means, and your book, being a history book, can also be summarized as it's more complicated than that. But um, yeah, so I would like to put to you, what is it more complicated than? Yeah, 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 no, <laughs> excellent. Um, well, I think it actually connects well to what I just said about the age of reason, because one of the things that it's more complicated than is sort of the, for the historians in the room, the Jonathan Israel thesis uh, of sort of the enlightenment as the beginning of modernity um, in which uh, following from the philosophy of uh, Burke de Spinoza, so the Dutch, of course, a philosopher, that following from his atheistic materialistic philosophy, uh, there came sort of a, 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 a great lineup of ideas, democracy, sexual emancipation, sexual and racial equality, uh, uh, freedom of expression, all of these kind of great ideas that, and, and values that we associate with modernity. Um, he you know, said that that sort of follows from that thought. And now, um, uh, you know, his, his work, is he's, he has a multi-volume uh, study of the Enlightenment and it's uh, been, been attacked from sort of ref, left, right and center. So I don't want to you know, uh, risk being uh, accused of beating a dead horse. But I think that Israel is indicative of something much wider, which is sort of the claiming of the Enlightenment as a kind of talisman that we should defend uh, against its enemies. And I think in my work, I you know tried to show that it's it's a lot more complicated and a lot more interesting than that, uh, in the sense that we also have to look at, we also have to recognize that their problems were not our problems, but we can learn from how they discussed their problems, um, and one of those problems was inequality, uh, which came you know to stand on a new footing and to be challenged from new angles and from new people, and so that's something that I think is really interesting to to explore, and then the other thing I think that. Um, just briefly, that it's maybe more complicated than, I guess, would be um, uh, the sort of simplistic association between the, en the Enlightenment and racism, which you see in some kind of postmodern circles, that um, uh, the Enlightenment was just, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a, an elaborate justification for inequality um, in new forms. And I think that's also too simplistic. Uh, indeed, the Enlightenment produced new discourses of inequality, but the, this again, you know, they 
also put equality on a new footing. And so we have to look at both in order to understand the full complexity of the movement. And so those are sort of the two um, kind of aspects that I, that, I, that I think it's more complicated then. Yeah, very good. <laughs> very, very complicated, and actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, to make it a bit less complicated, you know, so that for the benefit of the, the people who are not historians in the room, but also for historians, even of the period, maybe could you do a bit of scene setting for us? Where are we? Time, space, you know. You talk about encyclopedias there, where, where France, Britain, Switzerland, yeah. Could you give us an idea of what, what, what we're talking about, what, sure. what we're looking at? Yeah, yeah. so uh, for my research, I, I focused on three uh, major uh, 18th century encyclopedias. Uh, the oldest that I looked at was Ephraim Chambers' Cyclopedia, which was published in London in 1728. Uh, so it was a sole authored uh, work. Um, so, and then the, the next encyclopedia that I looked at was the famous uh, Encyclopédie of Denis Diderot and Jean-Laurent Dallon published in Paris between 1751 and 1772. And then the most recent encyclopedia I looked at was uh, the Swiss Encyclopédie d'Iverdon, it's called, uh, edited by an Italian émigré in Switzerland uh, named uh, De Felice. And that was published between 1770 and 1780 in a small Swiss town called Yverdon, uh, hence uh, Encyclopédie d'Iverdon. And um, uh, so we're basically talking about the entire pre-revolutionary 18th century. Um, uh, and and I think that you know, there's a lot that can be said, obviously, for to set the scene. But I think that perhaps two uh, elements are particularly important when we're thinking about equality and race uh, in this period. And the first would be uh, the growth and intensification of the transatlantic slave trade and the establishment of slave societies in the New World. So to give sort of a, an indication of just how intense this growth was, uh, Europeans transported enslaved Africans already starting in the 16th century to the, to, uh, to the Americas. Um, but it really intensified. Uh, in the late 17th century. So between 1650 and 1675, Europeans transported 500,000 enslaved Africans to the New World. When we get into the 18th century, so from 1700 to 1725, they transported one million. So we're at a double the number that it was in the 17th century. And then at the end of the 18th century, from 1775 to 1800, that number is doubled again. And it's two million enslaved Africans that Europeans transported to the New World. So um, uh, it's a... It's a real, you know, uh, you, cannot, you cannot understand race as a modern concept or equality and inequality as a modern concept without slavery. Uh, the context of uh, the establishment of slave societies and the intensification of the transatlantic slave trade. Not that race was in any simplistic way a justification for slavery because it's a lot, again, it's a lot more complicated than that, unfortunately, perhaps. Um, but... Uh, 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 it's obviously connected in interesting ways that perhaps we can talk uh, more about uh, later. And then, and then just for equality, the other thing that I wanted to mention for this period to set the context is the products that enslaved peoples were, were producing became basically necessities in European society in the 18th century. And I'm talking about coffee, sugar, tobacco and cotton. So uh, the 18th century witnessed the birth of you know, what historians call the public sphere. And the public sphere revolved around new institutions like the coffee house uh, or uh, uh, the literary cab the, the cabinet uh, of curiosities. And um, uh, uh, things that, the things that were consumed in these places were the products that enslaved labor uh, produced, so especially coffee and sugar. Uh, so as an example, uh, sugar consumption in England increased 20-fold in the 18th century. Um, so, uh, and, and then this is connected to equality in interesting ways because as the public sphere expanded, people from various social classes came together in ways that they didn't come together before. So it sort of challenged existing and very deep-rooted uh, uh, patterns of inequality. So, uh, but at the same time, of course, that there's an obvious contradiction between, you know, calls for equality at the same time that the slave trade is intensifying. So it's quite a quite a, a tension there. Yeah, this, this sounds very. It's very rich, and it's very hard to imagine all these things happening at the same time. You know, you imagine the sugar consumption increasing twenty fold, and then at the same time, this is happening overseas. And then, you know, yeah, it's it's. I think. I think one of the one of the strengths of your your book is that it forces us to 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 Im, to kind of reimagine uh, this world as material and it's connected to this intellectual uh, intellectual sphere as well. 
Um, so can we maybe now jump to the, some of these major interventions that you're, you're making in the book? And yeah, like I said, I, I really like how you show how ideas are rooted in these encyclopedias, which you can actually see and whatever. <laughs> but then maybe help us kind of tease out a little bit more. You know, how do you get from these you know, many volumes of in, you know, encyclopedia? How do these things, the ideas in these things, Transform. This is one of your claims, right? Transform the idea of inequality mm. in eighteenth century, in the eighteenth century. Right. Yeah. So I guess um, uh, it's important to realize that encyclopedias in the eighteenth century were sort of majorly popular. Uh, media. Um, they, literacy rates increased quite dramatically in the urban centers of Western Europe in the 18th century. And the ones that I looked at specifically were quite expensive. So, um, for example, Diderot and d'Alembert's Encyclopédie, the entire set of its massive folio volumes, they cost around 920 livres uh, by the time the entire thing was finished in the early 1770s. And the average salary of a working person in France was 200 uh, livres. So obviously, you know, it's the, the, the circulation was quite limited, but there were other editions that, uh, in quarto, so much smaller, octavo, even smaller sizes that were produced, such that by the time the revolution, the French Revolution broke out in 1789, there were about at least 15,000 encyclopédies, encyclopedias in circulation in France, which is an astonishing uh, number. Um, and so... Um, uh, not only the, the social context of, of how this was, the, the literature was, was read changed, uh, but also indeed, as you said, like the, the, the concept of equality itself changed. And so what I try to show in my book is that it became politicized. If you look at the evolution of equality across these encyclopedias. In the oldest encyclopedia that I used, um, equality only comes to the fore as a subtext uh, connected to religious toleration. So Ephraim Chambers was um, uh, a firm you know, believer in religious toleration, and therefore he defended a certain idea of basic equality. Because if you defend relig religious toleration, then that means that no one religion has the right to sort of have the upper hand in society. There's kind of a basic equality of rights uh, behind the religious diversity. Um, what you see is that in the French uh, or the French language encyclopedias that I used, equality becomes politicized to a degree unseen in European reference works before. Um, so as an example, uh, Louis de Jaucourt, the most prolific encyclopedist uh, in Diderot's circle, he wrote uh, many thousands of articles and um, uh, among which was a slave trade. And in that article, he puts equality to new uses by saying that it is an obvious inhumanity that judges in the new world where enslaved peoples are transported that they do not dec declare these enslaved peoples to be free, he says, because they are their fellow human beings and they have a soul like them, the judges. And so you see that equality is put to uses that it never was put to, to before, at least in reference works. And even actually in this was the most radical condemnation of, of slavery in French thought up until this time uh, in 1765. So um, uh, that's what I tried to show in, in, in the book is, is how equality was used in new ways uh, to call into question inequalities and inhumane treatment that had gone unquestioned for quite some time. Yeah, there's a there's a lot there's a lot in there, um, both about the yeah Joku. I'm really amazed at how how much he how much he wrote and yeah. yeah so I think it's something that I just I just wrote down here that when you say politicized, right, you mean like put to new political uses, right? I think this is mm. this is this is what you're you're saying. And this is what the 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 kind of big contribution of uh, these encyclopedias uh, was. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So maybe we can talk about let's let's talk about race, the other big um, term in in the title of your book. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, the kind of argument, like the nuance with which you treat this topic. And um, I take that one of the overarching assertions you're making is that, you mentioned it earlier a little bit also, is that often the same minds within, I'm going to quote you now, uh, often the same minds within that movement, meaning the Enlightenment, right, politicized equality and contributed to the discourse of inequality that was nascent racial science. So what's so tense about this combination of positions? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Um... I think what's so tense about it is that uh, it's just so striking that a, a thinker such as Diderot, um, who wrote, you know, again, some of the most vitriolic uh, condemnations of slavery in the 18th century, at least in the pre-revolutionary period, that a thinker like him 
contributed in very deep ways to racial science in the sense that he included humanity in uh, uh, histories of nature. Um, which allowed for the uh, uh, possibility to open up that human, different human groupings might be inherently unequal to one another. And he doesn't explicitly say that in, in such, in such you know, obvious uh, terms, but it, for example, in his article Human Species in the Encyclopédie, the way that he talks about various non-European peoples, it's imbued with a language of difference and of inequality. So he talks, for example, about... Uh, uh, Sub-Saharan African peoples as having a little understanding. Uh, yet at the same time, he also, again, in that same article, really harshly condemn, condemns uh, slavery. So you see that, um, uh, uh, that there's no sort of my, my goal was to sort of try to understand how this was possible. That, that, and I think that my, the solution that I tried to propose in the book was that race uh, in the 18th century, pre-revolutionary world at least, was not yet used as an explanation of inequality. So there was a sort of basic assumption among many Enlightenment thinkers that culture and so, what we would call socialization and culture shape human behavior to a, an, an astonishing degree, such that if peoples are exposed to the same education as upper class Europeans, they can achieve, they can be the equals of upper class Europeans. So you, obviously, you see that there's still an inequality here in the sense of Europeans are still the measure of what, you know, of achievement kind of thing. Um, um, but it's not a, it's not a hardened uh, racism in the sense that there is still this, this possibility that, that Diderot definitely uh, believe, and many others believed in. And then in, in, in Diderot's case, I mean, it gets even more interesting because of, in other works outside of the Encyclopédie that he, he published or, or wrote actually were published later uh, after his death. Um, because it was too dangerous to publish them when he was alive, uh, he really goes much deeper into uh, the, the role of culture in shaping an entire worldview and how Europe actually should not be the measure of everything that is just and good. Uh, so I'm thinking especially of his uh, supplement to the voyage of Bougainville, in which you know, it's, it's, it's a beautiful kind of exploration of the the fact that there is no sort of external standard with which we can measure culture. Uh, everything is always measured from the inside, even Europeans. So it's basically a call to his fellow Europeans to you know, tone down the ethnocentrism and the cultural kind of centrism. Yeah, I remember, I remember reading the Supplement when I, was, uh, when I was an undergrad, and I thought, this was written in the 18th century? This is remarkable. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, yeah, and um, I thought people could read it now and still feel a resistance to it. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, um, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Such an interesting, yeah, such an interesting in work, and also, uh, so, so I, hate, I hate this word, but it's so, so topical now, you know? Yeah, it's yeah. a kind of thing that we, we keep thinking about now, so yes. I think I'm going to kind of pivot to now and ask okay. you um, <laughs> about modern conceptions of uh, uh, and, and debates on race, because mm -hmm. I really love how you didn't shy away from that, in the, especially in the, in the conclusion, but you kind of engage with it throughout, throughout the book. You know, you say things like, oh, it doesn't mean that you should be relieved from the charge of this. You know, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't think of them as that. You know, but um, yeah, it's a very delicate matter, right? Balancing, you, you talk about balancing, they thought about this too, balancing social constructionist views and biological views mm -hmm. you know, uh, or approaches to the subject of race. Yeah. And so just for, for everybody here, you know, wondering, uh, who is not an 18th centuryist? You know, like if after reading your book, right, um, and what you show about Enlightenment race thinking, what would that do to our race thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think I think first and foremost, it it shows that race is a social construction. I mean, I think that that is even though I critique uh, what I call s strong social constructionism in the book, which I'll talk about in a moment. I think it, one of the great powers of studying history. Uh, especially intellectual history, is that uh, think categories that we take for granted, such as you know the idea that skin color is important in classifications of humanity. I think even if you resist that, you know just the language that we have to use because we live in 20, the twenty first century, you kind of can't get around it. Um, but the power of studying history is that you know it wasn't always like that. Like it was, it was you know that that has a history that that was invented. This idea that that physical features and ancestry should be used. To to classify, you know, that, 
that is not something natural at all. Um, so I think that's the first and foremost thing. But I think, I mean, this is, a, you know, coming from my dissertation. So this is, you know, I was engaging in conversations with scholars. So the scholars that I was trying to engage with, I wanted to challenge the strong social constructionism um, because I think it can be taken to quite an extreme such that any kind of uh, biological research, especially genetics, that's done about the deep human past uh, becomes problematized, where it, it, that kind of work just shouldn't be done, according to some scholars. And I felt that that is just a bit of, well, it's a shame if, if, if you, you know, they're, they're, the deep human past is something that we're all curious about. And given that we're talking about a period, you know, for of thousands of years before the invention of writing, we, you know, we have to use all the materials at our disposal to be able to understand that past. And, um, and, and what's striking to me is that the, gen the genetics research that's done, for example, I uh, have engaged a bit with uh, David Reich, uh, he's a geneticist at Harvard, and he's been challenged a lot by uh, social scientists, and I'm sure he's, you know, there is a lot that can be challenged, but I think that one of the powers of what his, he's found is that, you know, if you look at the great sweep of human history in our migrations throughout the world, you know, since uh, uh, the migration out of Africa. Like, there have been constant mixings and remixings and displacements. So there's no, the idea of a pure race or an, a, a truly kind of indigenous people is just completely false. <laughs> so, so I think that that is, um, uh, it was also a call to sort of also respect the, bio, the biological sciences, uh, not that we should be uncritical of them, but at least that we, we shouldn't from the outset um, just say that this kind of research is always problematic because of course it, it you know, you know, it's totally understandable given that that kind of research has been put to such um, abhorrent purposes, you know, of, of eugenics, uh, the dark history of scientific racism. So I don't, I don't, you know, want to downplay that at all. But I think that geneticists like David Reich, who, you know, they're, as far as I can tell, they're, the goal is not to uh, dehumanize. It's, it's, I, you know, it's first and foremost to understand the complex human past before uh, the invention of writing, which requires a lot of different techniques. So that's sort of what, uh, uh, what I have to say about it. <laughs> no, it's great. I mean, I, uh, when, I read, when I read the conclusion of your book, I remember thinking, okay, now he's going to go like, you know, like what all historians do, which is like, history was different from now. Therefore, <laughs> we must study history. Or something, yeah. something really, you know, but, I, I, but a more sophisticated version of that. Then you went into this deep stuff about, you know, biology and how it has its problems, but we have to take it seriously as well. And it doesn't mean that we have to close our minds off to various ways of, you know, the various inquiries, uh, you know, approaches to, to, to this subject. And I thought, wow, this is, this is very serious. Um, so I have loads of bonus questions, as, as, you, uh, as you know, yeah. um, but we have no time. So, but... Shit. Well, Devin, I, I have said this before, I said this to you, but for the public record, I want to say that I read this book with great interest, enjoyment, and admiration, and I'm so excited that it's out here now, you know, ready to kind of educate, to change minds, and to, you know, cast new light on a period and uh, on subjects on which every ideological and scholarly grouping wants to have the last say. Yeah. So, I mean, I just want to congratulate you on that, and... Uh, yeah, I hope it gets the readership and acclaim that it most certainly deserves, Devin. Well, yeah. thank you. No, That's really beautifully said. Okay, well, now I'd like to hand the floor over to our discussants, so, uh, who will speak for around eight minutes each, after which Devin will offer a brief response. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, good afternoon to everybody. I'm delighted to be here and to say a few words about Devin's wonderful book. Let me make a very brief introduction. I met Devin in 2016 at the London Summer School in Intellectual History, and I have been immediately struck by his great intellectual curiosity, engagement, open-mindedness, um, scrupulousness, and a taste for nuances. It's more complicated. <laughs> uh, accompanied by an extraordinary historiographical culture, he had read a lot, almost everything in his subject, and everything interested him. 
all these characteristics, intellectual curiosity and motivation, thoughtfulness, accuracy and knowledge, are fully reflected in his book. We have kept in touch since, uh, ever since. Devin then uh, got a two-year Rubicon postdoctoral fellowship in order to work in Paris at my institution, they called the uh, Haute Etude en Sciences Sociales. But an unexpected problem did occur, the COVID. So instead of a couple of years, Devin ended up to stay in Paris only a couple of months, unfortunately. But in the meantime, fortunately, he got a permanent position as assistant professor at Utrecht University and published this important book. Both are great achievements, which are even more worth than a mess in Paris, at least in my view. The color of equality. The title of the book is striking, promising as well as challenging. It encompasses two terms that are not generally associated. Um, skin color, one of the main features of enlightenment racial construction, as we have just heard, becomes in the title a qualitative attribute of equality a term which is, by definition and essence, colorless. This happens in the very moment in which equality is conceived and theorized by Enlightenment thinkers, as the very appropriate subtitles of the book clarifies. What emerges since the title are thus the deep tensions and ambivalences uh, between equality and race, racial classification and common humanities uh, in uh, the polyphonic di diversities of Enlightenment thought. Race is a concept and a terminology in the making in the 18th century, and so is considered by Devin in its polyvalent usages and un unstable meanings. Devin raises one of the most difficult and vexing questions in Enlightenment intellectual history. How was it that the intellectual movement that did so much to invent modern notions of equality also contributed to forge uh, theories of race? How could Enlightenment thinkers conceive at the same time equality of race, human sameness and differences, hierarchies and universal rights? How could it happen that these apparently opposite stances were in fact connected? His response is nuanced, uh, again, it's more complicated than that, learned as well as sensitive. Using three major and related Enlightenment encyclopedias from England, France and Switzerland, the book provides a rich contextualization of the conflicting ideas of human equalities and racial inequalities in 18th century, between the 1720s we have here and the uh, 1780, so to shed light to, on the multiple Enlightenment debates, philosophical, scientific, juridical, as well as political, throughout Europe. The crucial point that the book makes is that in Enlightenment thought, we have heard from Devin himself, the politicization of the concept of equality went hand in hand with the naturalization of inequalities in humankind. In order to address this complex issue, Devin follows a double strategy. He focuses on a variety, a vast array of 18th century sources, while also uh, maintaining a permanent and close dialogue with modern historiography. He shows convincingly that Enlightenment philosophy ch changed the way of thinking about human sameness and difference. He makes the point that this has to put in relation to the development of the autonomy of the individual and the theorization of the culture and practice of sociability. This is a strong, interesting, as well as convincing thesis. Here, it is crucial to understand that universalism, within which a discourse of the rights of men and their equality has been developed, also induced new hierarchies between human groups. For paradoxical and counterintuitive as it may seem, it is precisely when universalism and egalitarian rights are affirmed that it becomes all the more necessary to invent I, uh, stress this point, categories that uh, justify inequality, such as races. By contrast, when hierarchy and inequality form a, an uncontested framework, like in the system of slavery, for example, there was little need to, for theoretical justification of inequality. Inequality was a matter of fact. Indeed, it is with the abolition of slavery and, uh, the, that race and racism arise this most becoming a stronger problem than ever. What is more, polygenism does not always mean defense of slavery during the 18th century. 
Conversely, as was well known, many of the founding fathers of the United States of America were slave owners at the same time as they used the language of natural and universal rights of men, just to give an example. Two discourses intertwine in the Enlightenment. The first is a universalist, all men are equal and have equal dignity, but according to the second, some are more advanced or more enlightened and others are not yet so. This duality is the, the heart of the philosoph conception of humanity. The natural and universal histories of the Enlightenment are the matrices of a discourse that unites and divides humanity, creating space for different races. One of the crucial achievements of this book, in my view, is that it is very nuanced, and again, more complicated than that, and self-reflexive, a feature that Devin sees as characterizing the Enlightenment itself. It rejects any simplistic definitions, uh, avoiding dichotomous views of the Enlightenment as either an emancipatory or a pernicious movement of modernity. It carefully refrains from putting the Enlightenment on trial, either for defending or for condemning the philosoph. On the contrary, this is a rigorous intellectual history which deeply contributes to our understanding of such a complex and ambivalent movement in close di dialogue with some important works of the last years, and first of all with Sepp Sturman's great book on the invention of humanity. This is also the first study entirely devoted uh, to how major enlightenment encyclopedias dealt with the question of human equality, racial inequality, and the emergence of a philosophy of human rights. Not only are encyclopedias central instruments for the collection and the diffusion of knowledge, in order, I quote from Diderot, to change the way people think in the entry encyclopedia, they also represent the quintessence of enlightenment debate. By placing side by side different and conflicted voices dealing with the major questions of the day, encyclopedias provide a stage for debate which help to grasp the complexities and polyphony of the Enlightenment. Indeed, Enlightenment thinkers did not give shape to a single and unique discourse on human nature and human progress, nor they did share the same conceptions of rights. They did produce different narratives in which they questioned disputed and answered each other, taking part in broad controversies ranging all over Europe and beyond. Even their condemnation of slavery was not based on the same assumptions. So, in a sense, the polyphony and the plurality of the encyclopedia reflects the polyphony and plurality of Enlightenment thought. There is so much more to be said, and in fact, I could talk for hours. But don't worry, we stop here as my eight minutes are over. I will therefore conclude by asking three questions to Devin. First, why have you chosen encyclopedias as the lens through which looking at equality and race? For their importance as instruments of knowledge, for their publishing success, uh, because of the multiplication of points of view, or because they allow to see more or to see otherwise than, for example, a text on moral philosophy, natural history, or a political essay. And connected to this, do encyclopedias specific form of organization of knowledge and their alphabetical order matter on the conception of uh, humanity, equality, or race? Second question. The book focuses very much on race and slavery, much less on women and women's rights. Why? Can you say something on this issue? Finally, um, in recent years, the question of the boundaries between humanity and animality has been studied in relation to slavery, while the discourse on rights uh, has been expanded to animals. How do you um, deal with these studies and approaches? Do they challenge or not your way of thinking about society in the 18th century and beyond? So to conclude, let me uh, thank Devin for this book and say that the color of equality is not only a welcome contribution that fills a historiographical lacuna, it is also a much needed book to think about enlightenment and its modern legacy. <laughs>
Well, first of all, let me start by uh, thanking uh, Devon and the organizers of this day for inviting me to participate in this debate. Um, it's a great honor. I mean, we didn't know each other from Adam, but you sent me an email and I said, yes, I would love to uh, come and respond. Um, I have to say right from the outset, I'm uh, going to take a rather critical approach uh, very much because I'm dealing with, I think, some of the same questions which you're dealing with. Um, actually, this vexed term of enlightenment itself and uh, its usefulness. Uh, so I'll come to that in the end. But um, let me just start by saying that I think uh, this is a very pressing topic, obviously. Um, and I think it's also a very fascinating and very nuanced, even unflinching book, I would say, uh, at some points. As you demonstrate that, and I quote you, the Enlightenment philosophe most firmly committed to an egalitarian politics also contributed to racial classification, end of quote. I think that's a rather strong statement. And um, I have to say also on a more personal note, as someone who has worked on the religious enlightenment, I also appreciate very much the fact that you also make this argument about the Protestant Encyclopédie des Verdun that has traditionally been perceived as uh, ideologically more moderate and hence less interesting for the enlightenment debate and the enlightenment history. You actually, uh, you actually demonstrate very convincingly, I think, um, that it's actually in some respects uh, more radical in uh, and certainly in its view of uh, slavery and its radical anti-slavery stance than the Paris Encyclopédie, which of course is much better known in historiography of the Enlightenment. So that's, um, and I think one of the things which is very interesting is that you uh, uh, demonstrate that it's because it adopts a very specific language of sentiment um, that this Christian encyclopedia actually uh, makes, takes this much more radical stance. And uh, sentiment, uh, in modern terms, what we would call empathy and what in the 18th century was described as sympathy, sympathy. So that was um, something which I uh, appreciated uh, in particular, the way you actually link these three very different encyclopedias and end up showing that this last encyclopedia and actually, goes, actually goes farther than the others, despite what some people have perceived as a more moderate uh, starting point. As you point out in your book, our modern concept of race is the product of a very long evolution and a history of interactions, violent interactions, also between groups. Scientific racism goes back to a very precise historical context, as you uh, underline, which is the empire-building 19th century, while modern critical race theory, of course, is the product of another very specific context of racial violence in the United States. Um, so for us today, the concept of race is a loaded one. Um, and I think your book succeeds admirably in showing how careful we have to be in actually applying this concept to a very different historical context. As you show, until the 1760s, there was a relative lack of concern with skin pigmentation as a marker of difference. In the 1760s and 1770s, however, when skin color did come to the fore, it also did so within a very specific context, which was a scientific natural history context. For example, in the writings of Buffon, i.e., as you again underline very uh, carefully, it did not yet function as a justification for inequality, as it later would in the 19th century. So it seems to me, if I actually step back a little bit, that a radical outcome of your book might be to discard the concept of race altogether, uh, as historically too weighted down by all these 19th and 20th century and 21st century meanings to actually be that useful in making sense of how 18th century thinkers engaged with issues of difference. But then I think the next step if we were to discard these modern concepts of race, might be to look more closely at 18th century actors' categories. And you do do that in your book. As you point out in the Encyclopédie, the article race in French uh, defines the concept exclusively in terms of extraction or lineage, i.e. nowhere is the modern biological or ethnic sense of race invoked. Race instead refers to dynasties. For example, the three races of French kings, i.e. the Merovingians, the Carolingians, and the Capetians. So it's a completely different sense than the modern concept of race. And there is more generally also a, a repeated connection between race and nobility, the way this term is used in the 18th century. So it's something completely different than what we're talking about today. You also mention in your book the concept of caste, which is also a very interesting concept, which was a, the matrix of earlier Spanish colonial racial categorization systems. And it's very interesting because in this instance, the concept of caste, of course, links race also and sexual anxieties, 
Um, the Spanish casta, of course, comes from the Latin castus, i.e. chaste. Uh, so there's all these other subtexts which are also there, which you reference, but I, I would actually invite you to follow them up a little bit more. And you also mentioned something else, which are ethnic terms, which were used along the slave coast of West Africa, for example, such as Minas, the Jagas, and others. And some of these are still identifiable racial or linguistic groups. My husband, for example, is a Mina. He self-identifies as a Mina. So there's all these different categories which you invoke in your book. Um, I would say actors categories, uh, as opposed to our modern concept of race. Um, so I'd be very curious to hear a little bit more about these and how might using these actors' categories rather than our modern category of race actually nuance, further nuance, or otherwise change your argument. So this is book two, I would say. <laughs> um, perhaps more uncomfortably, I think, in talking about actors' categories is, the, of course, the absence in the discourse you study of the very people who are being talked about. As you write, and again I quote you, there is in fact an inequality built into the very concept of enlightenment, as the philosophes position themselves as the enlightened few in contrast to unenlightened others. End of quotation. I would add here, and this is a bit mean, the white few. Your book is very much about white people, white men, discussing equality and race. But what about non-white views? Was the idea of a non-white philosophe conceivable? Or did one have to be white to be enlightened? More concretely, how did these 18th century encyclopedias engage with contributions of non-white thinkers also active in this period? I'm thinking, for example, of a well-known figure in the Netherlands, in any case, like Johannes Jacobus Kapitein, Jacobus Elisa Kapitein, the first black African to receive a doctorate from Leiden University in 1742, whose work was well publicized in his own day because of his defense of slavery, but whose thought, in fact, was considerably more nuanced, as recent re-evaluations are arguing. In her recent book, Black Cosmopolitans, for example, Christine Levesque points to what she describes as the radical possibilities of his Calvinism in fostering egalitarian thinking. So he was also thinking about uh, equality in terms of natural rights, of, uh, in terms of natural law. She shows that the work of Capitain actually makes an argument about human equality, but articulated in terms of multicultural, multiracial communities. So is there any dialogue in the 18th century encyclopedias with non-white thinkers like Capitain, for example, who was mostly known in Holland? I don't think he reached France, although he wrote in Latin, so of course, uh, potentially, uh, his work was out there. Or are non-white thinkers completely absent from this discourse which you describe? Of course, Capitain is a very specific example and a particularly complex one, of course, because he actually defended slavery, even though he actually did believe that everyone was naturally equal. Um, but there is another omission I would like to hear a little bit more about, and that is the Middle East and North Africa. Your book offers very compelling comparative analysis of the encyclopedia's treatments of China, of Native Americans, and of Sub-Saharan Africa. You demonstrate that Sub-Saharan Africans were the subject of a racialized discourse significantly more often than were Native Americans, while the Chinese were least often subjected to such racialization. But if there was one non-European region that Europeans knew well in the 18th century, even intimately in some aspects, it was the Middle East. As Madeleine Doby has shown, much of the discourse on slavery in 18th century France was actually displaced onto texts dealing with North Africa and the Middle East. And of course, North Africa and the Middle East had produced thinkers with whose work the encyclopedists were familiar, available in Compiègne, such as Barthélemy d'Herbelot's Bibliothèque Orientale, and with whom they might have engaged in debate in their discussions on equality and race. Even closer to home, uh, there were substantial non-Christian populations in Europe itself who were also the subject of racialized discourse. I realize this is an uncomfortable question, but to what extent are Jews too racialized in these encyclopedias as are sub-Saharan Africans and to a lesser extent Native Americans? In your conclusion, you write that, again I cite you, Benjamin Disraeli's contention that all is race would have been alien to Enlightenment thinkers. Now I can't help but wonder about this, which Enlightenment thinkers? 
In your conclusion, you argue that despite the complex, often contradictory nature of the material you present, there is a thin coherence to the Enlightenment project. And I love this phrase, the thin coherence. But I wonder how this thin coherence might productively be complicated by these other actors' categories. Or might the Enlightenment itself then also implode as a useful intellectual concept, like the concept of race itself? And I ask this very much as someone who's been struggling with this whole concept of the Enlightenment uh, for many years now. It's a wonderful heuristic category, but how useful is it finally? And should we actually end up ditching it in some form or another? So I leave you with that big one. <laughs> Thank you. So, hi. Now, a bit to something completely different. I'm the only non-historian speaking here, but uh, I noticed three women commenting on this book. It's interesting. Um, we need to talk about uh, David Reich, but we'll do that another time. Uh, there are many aspects uh, to his work, a uh, lot to be admired, but also some interesting uh, moves that he had made recently. But um, that's for another issue. OK, so uh, Devin, it's a great pleasure to, to be here and, and a wonderful occasion. Congratulations a lot uh, with, your, uh, with the book. Um, it is a book, obviously written by a historian, but I do hope that it will have a much wider readership. Um, because I think it's an important book for everybody who is interested in the complex working of race in society. And I am deeply convinced that we cannot understand this politics of race, and I'm not saying racism, if we do not take this history into consideration, because precisely histories are never quite left behind. I have a PowerPoint. I need to check whether it is working. OK, yes, that's good. Um, well, modes of thinking and knowing similarity and differences have sedimented uh, in our archives. So this is the reason why um, history is never le left behind. In our archives, in our institutions, in technologies, and if we think of the current medical practices, uh, as well as objects and methods that are currently used in scientific practice. And you should know that I so now and then work also in laboratories where I encounter these kind of technologies. As a social scientist, I work there. So I always tell my students, if you want to keep race and race science at bay, you cannot go to the hospital. Because practices of race and science and racial classification had become part and parcel of medical knowledge, and as well as the care that you perceive, you receive, practices and setting that we are all in one way or the other um, grown to appreciate. So, and this is the importance of the color of equality, we need to develop a much better understanding of how race came about and how it has been made relevant. Now, much has been written about race science in the 19th and 20th century and about the devastating um, contribution to the colonial project as well as for the massacres and the genocide during World War II. But as Devon demonstrates, and I'm quoting him, the physical diversity of humanity was a real intellectual problem for the philosophe of the Enlightenment. And you say race and racial classification were their answer, were, was their answer to that. And again, I'm quoting you, I point, you say, to the way in which the matter was more complicated than the creation and maintenance of an allegedly superior white race, even if that is one of the most important stories to be told. This, I think, is really the innovative contribution of the book, that, that is to understand what work race has been, uh, has been made to do. Um, other than just feeding into persistent inequalities. I think this is relevant for our current day practice uh, as well. So in my field of research, which is mostly, um, or among many other few, uh, issues, genetics and, and race, there is a common understanding that race does not exist. This is something, that, there was this breach after the Second World War, um, you know, the evidence is not there for uh, race differences. There are no fu fundamental differences between groups. However, in genetic research, we see race appearing all the time, as a, cl a classification device, that is. Also, a tool to make sense of the enormous amount of data that is being produced on a daily basis. And this is why I indeed discussed uh, with you, uh, Devin, a few years ago, the possibility of seeing race not merely as an object of research, so referring to differences out there between human um, uh, groups, but also as a method of research and a classificatory device. So a, a convenient way of ordering uh, uh, data. 
Even if race is inherently political, it is absolutely important to take the effort of studying it in more nuances, and this is what you do. So, of course, it does matter if racial classifications are used to analyze data, but how it matters becomes a much more complicated question. And I didn't realize I was using the word complications uh, as much as you do. So, in any case, things are complicated. Um, so, I just want to make sure this is not in uh, on my paper, but uh, I think Devin and I share this interest of race, uh, you know, how is it done, how is it produced, how it is uh, immobilized, not to embrace it as a classification device for ourselves, but actually how has it been done and how, well, how does it figure uh, in there. And I want that to be clear. So I'm not a social scientist who says we need this category of race to classify people in society in order to study them better, right? Let that be clear. So let me move on, and I hope I can make the eight uh, minutes, because I want to share a contemporary example with you, uh, and maybe to there would pose a question to uh, uh, to uh, Devin, um, because key in the book is obviously this issue of politicization of equality. On the one hand, during the Enlightenment, equality became a baseline, and there was questioning metaphysical orders. Uh, um, uh, and on the other hand, there's this um, extending relevance of uh, inequality that came to the fore, uh, the issue of race. And as Sieb Stuermann, he's sitting there in the back, has shown, to be equal, you have to become like us European whites. So uh, this is um, very explicitly um, addressed in, uh, in, in the invention of humanity. So I find it interesting that race is typically connected with difference then, right? So what about race and sameness, hence the title of, uh, put here on the slide. So one of the articulation that I missed in the book, but maybe we should put it there as a question, can we think race in relation to sameness rather than only in relation to difference? And I want to share an example, very contemporary, very much uh, Dutch, <laughs> uh, uh, from Friesland, to make it uh, even more explicit. Uh, uh, this is a forensic case uh, that really invited me to think about the possibility, uh, you know, what we can learn from thinking about race in terms of sameness. So the issue is um, uh, um, um, a rape and murder case of a young girl after celebrating uh, Queen's Night, as it was then, um, uh, and she, her body was found the next day. This, this is all in the rural part of the Netherlands, in the northern part in, uh, in Friesland. Now, uh, there were no clues about who the suspect is. There was uh, lots of suspicion vis-a-vis -vis inhabitants of an asylum seeker center nearby uh, the, the, the place of murder. Uh, there was, so there was lots of violence and lots of racism. But uh, no clues about this murder. So in March 2009, in a TV show called The Sixth Census, psychics, so paragnost paragnosten, were asked to help a forensic artist to produce a composite drawing of the unknown suspect. And this was um, his composite face. And... Um, the father of the girl, Mariana Fatstra, was made to look at this uh, picture. And then he says, those eyes are eyes of a killer. The face is clearly, doubtless, a face of an asylum seeker. So he was thus hinting at the ongoing suspicion that it must have been one of the inhabitants of the asylum seeker center. Um, the girl was um, uh, raped killed and her um, uh, neck was sliced with a, with a knife. And this was categorized as a non-Dutch mode of killing. Uh, Muslims tend to cut the throats of animals, blood, <laughs> warm-blooded animals. Now, a few years later, in 2012, a novel DNA technology into, um, was introduced into the Dutch legislation, a so-called familiar searching, uh, verwantschapsonderzoek. This technology was overnight used for, uh, in Mariana Vaatstra. It was actually, the law was enacted to solve this, help solve this case. 8,000 men were invited to donate their DNA in order to find the suspect through one of them. So they were not suspected themselves, but maybe a son, a father, an uncle uh, was the actual um, uh, suspect. Um, I will highlight, and, and uh, he was caught overnight. Um, I should say that one of my former students in forensic science was actually working on the case, and she was the one who found the matches. So um, this was the suspect, Jasper S. You see, he's nicely, uh, you know, his privacy is, is protected here. Um, 
Uh, this is how it was announced on that morning as I was li listening uh, to the news. P uh, Peter Erdefries, I should say the late Peter Erdefries, he was brutally killed not so long ago, a month ago or so. Uh, he was very much involved in the case and he said, man arrested, white man, Friesian, lives 2.5 kilometers from the crime scene. 100% DNA match because they found the suspect and not his relative. Um, uh, Yes, 100% the DNA match. So the, uh, the, the father of Mariana then immediately responded, so it's someone from our midst, a farmer, a white man. Well, DNA doesn't lie, but with a lot of land, this is a man with lots of land and, and, uh, and, li uh, and uh, livestock uh, farm. So, you know, how can it be that such a person uh, ha uh, has done that? Um, he, he has nearly 100 uh, uh, dairy cows. And they are being looked after now, people were, uh, were responding. About 300 residents show up in a village hall. The mayor is there, and he says, uh, he, I, you know, the village will not let the family down. Uh, he knows the family, the parents of the arrested man. Everyone knows the parents. They're very well known in the village. And I think this, this, the parents aspect of this suspect is really interesting. And the, the, the mayor then goes on to, see, to say, you know, I want to give this family the sense that you belong here, you belong, you live here, you live the bay. And we are around the family. We stand on the family home. So, but some in Oswalde usually import, this is another uh, uh, media outlet, find it interesting, apart, that this uh, week meetings were organized in the church where residents could, sh could show their sympathy to the family of the suspect. So how did it feel for the, you know, the, the family of Mariana Fadstra? So what am I trying to, to tell you here? I was surprised actually by this uh, feeling of usness, this feeling of we belong together, not just in, uh, in Friesland, but actually pretty much also in the Netherlands. In Friesland, it was very, uh, very stark. So, with these examples from the media, I wanted to demonstrate how sameness gets, gets crafted. Sameness, sameness is not a baseline. It, there's nothing natural about it. It is something that we produce together. The suspect in, uh, uh, was in his 50s, had his own family, you know, with adult children. But he was referred to, as I said, as a, the child of. References were made to his parents constantly. Sympathy uh, you know, went to them. His parents had a, a history there in that village, huh? uh, they were they were there and they belonged there to the family. They hoard the bay. So connecting lineage to genealogy to the place is a potent way of doing race, as we know, also from your book. But so is also the reference to the suspect being a farmer. You know, uh, uh, occupation, as we know, is a classical mar a marker of doing race later on. So not in the uh, uh, like, but later on. So that we uh, maybe. I'm not a historian. See, see, I'm not a historian there, so <laughs> I know that it is uh, older than that. We know this from the Roma. We know this also from Jewish people, how, you know, uh, their, their uh, occupations matter. So he was referred to, uh, referred to as a farmer with dairy cow cows and someone who would take good care of his dairy cows. And I find all these uh, interesting uh, references uh, important as other kinds of markers of race. So... This example for me um, is a case of trying to understand the relation between race and sameness rather than difference. Although differences is always there, sameness is also an entry, uh, as an entry point can give us other, uh, yeah, bring other aspects to the surface. So for example, where in the enlightenment, physical phenotypical markers such as appearance, the way we look, came to play a key role. It is also clear that privileging some markers over others is related to Europeans' colonial project, Europe's uh, colonial project. Color was, for example, less a uh, dividing marker in early history South of South Africa, so not the apartheid uh, period, right? So starting from sameness and not privileging physical diversity brings in a much wider collection of techniques, but it crucially shows us that uh, uh, difference uh, shows us a difference between sa uh, sameness as usness and sameness as them, you know, othering. Because where sameness as usness, I hope it has become clear here, um, 
brings in the possibility, leaves always the possibility to attend to individuality. So there is a collective that is us that has a color or has an origin, but there is also the family and the individual, as we have seen the, uh, how Jasper S um, appeared there on, uh, on screen. Whereas sameness as them tends to uh, 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 lump the group together. There is no space for individuality if you are the other. So, um, I, I, so my question to you is actually, do you see this, this uh, attending to this crafting of sa sameness more than assuming it as a possibility to open up uh, um, uh, this category of, of race uh, precisely in the period that you have been working on, uh, keeping in mind that uh, Sylvia has addressed that so much more eloquently. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, uh, all three of you. This is uh, fantastic. It gives me uh, really a lot to think about. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll try to be uh, brief, but as comprehensive as possible. Uh, there's a lot to think about. So Sylvia, uh, why the encyclopedias? Um, uh, this is a really uh, a good question, and, and whether or not their ordering of knowledge matters for the topic that I've studied. The choice for encyclopedias was uh, uh, to start off, actually, a uh, methodological and practical choice to make a very large and complicated project uh, doable. Um, uh, but more than that, I think, once I, started, once I got going with the research, um, uh, I think that uh, it was fascinating to see that these encyclopedias, especially Diderot and Alambert, of course, were seen as so it's quintessential, you know, quintessential Enlightenment products, uh, such that both uh, scholars who criticize the Enlightenment and both who praise it use the same texts to do both of those things. And so for that reason, I think that they were, are particularly interesting for looking at equality and inequality. Um, and, uh, uh, and then whether or not, I mean, the ordering of knowledge, I think, is incredibly important in, the, in, in, in terms of how these topics were discussed. And I think that, that that's actually one of the one of the arguments that some historians have made of making sense of of what is often presented as a paradox is that it had more to do with conventions of genre or different uh, uh, fields of knowledge that the different modes of writing about non-europeans were used such as in the literary mode the more sentimental uh, mode was used and in the sort of natural historical mode the more uh, classificatory, uh, inegalitarian kind of mode uh, was used. So, and I think there's a lot to, uh, to be said about that, but um, in the interest of time, I'll just continue. Um, uh, women and women's rights and animal rights, I'll try to answer together. Um, I mean, I tried to bring in gender as much as I could uh, uh, because I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it comes up a lot, of course. I mean, the, the, the assumption is, is, is always uh, uh, that, they're that they're talking about men, and that becomes very clear in the encyclopedias when, for example, Diderot writes uh, leur femme he, about a certain people, so their women. So he literally, you know, uses a possessive uh, uh, word, which is quite uh, striking. Um, um, and I tried to bring that out as much as I, as much as I could. Um, uh, and I think what I could have done more with is to to look at how. Uh, 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 and this is, of course, what your, why your work is so important, is how the treatment of women in various societies becomes a marker of judging societies and how, why and how this happened. Uh, uh, and, and so that, that is something that I think that, that I, I definitely could have, could have done more with. Um, uh, but as I said, I mean, I think that what I, what I took, what I tried to show is that um, and this I'm getting from uh, my advisor Steve Stuermann's work, is that the Enlightenment was, a, the Enlightenment thinkers didn't problematize gender. I think gender was problematized before the Enlightenment, and that helped actually pr to produce the discourse and the philosophy of Enlightenment was the fact that already in the 17th century, naturalized sexual inequal sex inequality of the sexes had been challenged to such an extent that this contributed to the Enlightenment as, as such. Um, and then for animal rights, I mean, I think that this is um, this is something that that is that is very complex, and and in the sense that, it, and again, we see sort of the same contradictory legacy, I think, when it comes to animal rights uh, as to human rights, which is that, on the one hand, when you open up, when you include humanity in histories of nature and say that humanity is not 
let's say, God's special creation, it's just another animal species that exists on the earth, then you, I think, open up both egalitarian and inegalitarian perspectives. So you open up egalitarian in the sense that, are we really so different from animals? Well, not that much different, but also on the other hand, yes, we are different. So, so you open up, I think, you, both possibilities in, in really deep ways. And, and, and I but I think what I like to stress is that, you know, uh, the, uh, it's fascinating that the, the modern animal rights movement only started in the late 18th century. So, and it had a lot to do, though, with the discourse of sentiment. And so this is, I think, for me, uh, one of the most important, given that uh, the idea of animal rights was basically unthinkable, in Europe at least, uh, before the, the 18th century. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Alicia, thank you so much for uh, really rich questions. Um, um, I think that um, uh, when you talk about actress categories, you're absolutely right that it's um, uh, more about uh, um, uh, nobility, actually, uh, than uh, race in the 18th century, when they defined it. But what's striking is that when they used it, the, the definitions of the term didn't keep up with its innovative usage. So I think that that's really important to, to notice, is that no 18th century dictionary defined race as, a, as we understand it. But uh, Diderot and Buffon, for example, used it all the time in the, in the ways that we understand as you know, a combination of ancestry and skin color or other physical features. Some combination of that to talk about human grouping. So they use that quite a lot. Um, and um, uh, the absence of non-white peoples in the book is, is certainly something that uh, didn't escape my attention. And the, the issue, I guess, was that um, I wanted to solve a problem in European intellectual history. And um, you know, in, in the conclusion, I allude to the fact that the way that Europeans wrote about equality was necessarily in conversation with non-Europeans. And also, non-Europeans did have agency in the sense that uh, the humanitarian discourse of the philosoph developed, of course, in often in sometimes even direct response to, for example, slave revolts. Um, uh, so I, try, I think I could have done definitely more with that. But well, book number two is <laughs> where, where that will happen. Um, uh, and I think this idea of, of whether or not a non-white person could be a philosoph, I think that uh, the answer is absolutely yes, because, I mean, uh, this is obviously changes across the 18th century and is dependent upon specific European contexts. But I mean, in Germany, there were very striking examples of many black people who got PhDs and who were uh, part of the public discourse well into, into the 18th century. Um, uh, and um, so I think that, but of course, this can be contrasted easily with the well-known comments of Immanuel Kant, uh, which are you know, quite deeply, deeply racist. Um, uh, and then for, um, uh, just in the interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> uh, switch to the, the usefulness of the Enlightenment, because I think that that's um, something that, that, is, that is really uh, striking in, in what you've said. And I think that you know, we're still sort of trying to struggle with the fact that, uh, well, the Enlightenment was, of course, a 19th century invention, or, well, perhaps also the French revolutionaries, but certainly the Enlightenment. But I think that, I think that you know, the, the fact that D'Alembert uses the term uh, lumière and éclairé, so enlightenment and uh, uh, enlightened, I think something on the order of like 40 times in the uh, preliminary discourse to the Encyclopédie, I think it says a lot about how they conceived of themselves, even if it, even if it wasn't, um, uh, I think it's more of a term that can be find, defined in the negative. Uh, uh, that's how I like to see it, that, that there was very little positive that they agreed about, because they disagreed about so many things. But when it came to certain things, namely uh, uh, um, fundamentalist religious dogma and absolutist political authority, those were things that they all could rally around, and that they did all rally around when one of, the, sort of their own was attacked by the church or the state, which happened, of course, very often. Um, and uh, um, Amada, uh, I really like this idea of using sameness as, as looking at, uh, at race. Um, and in fact, this is actually, I think, a, a really uh, fruitful way what, that you, we, more research could be done on the 18th century in this regard, in the sense that 
Uh, I'm thinking of a historian named David Bell who has written about the rise of French nationalism. And he actually argues in that book, one of his arguments is that the French, you could make an argument that the French racialized uh, inter, inter-European uh, rivalries more than they did European and non-European, especially in their rivalry with Great Britain. Uh, uh, so um, the way that the, the French, of course, you know, they're, they're long-standing enemies, the English, the, this is, it does not mean that just because they were such long-standing enemies that they were always racialized, but what you see is that they were talked about in racialized terms in the 18th century, more and more, as the concept of the nation became so much more powerful in the 18th century. So, and again, you know, this shows how race is in flux because, given that we're used to thinking about race as you know whiteness, blackness, and 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 uh, other skin colors, that you know we wouldn't it, it would be quite strange for in the 21st century world to talk about English people as being different racially from French people. But in fact, there was a time, a long period of time, where this was actually done. Uh, and you see, you see many examples of this also in, in, with the history of how Italians in the United States were racialized, how Jewish people were racialized, etc. So, so it's it's quite so. It, this, there's a lot to, to go off of here, but I I, I'll, I think I'll stop talking here because otherwise we don't have any time. So, but thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you so much to all our panelists. And I think, yeah, like I think all of you said, we, we could, um, you know, continue the discussion into the night, but I'm sure that there are some burning questions around here, you know, uh, patient, people are patiently waiting to ask their questions. Um, the questions can be directed to any member of the panel, so I don't know if you want to come up to join, uh, join Devin on, on stage? No? <laughs> yeah. Yes, and in the back, lady in the back. Thank you. It's not so much a question as a small reminder. Um, there was in the last speaker was talking about the belonging in this village. I think it's a very important point that belonging in villages is a, a universal quality that people have everywhere. So I just would like to remind you of a West African proverb that is applying here, and it's one of my favorites. It is a Mandinka proverb, and it says, no matter how long the tree trunk lies in the water, it will never become a crocodile. It, it is about belonging and those not belonging. And I think we need to be more and more aware of this unimural quality uh, that we all have somewhere, somehow. So I think maybe it's good to remind all of us of that. Thank you. Does anybody, anybody want to respond? If not, we can go to, go to the next question. Anyone else? This question? I'm sure you have questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Elia. So, thanks. <laughs> uh, I've read Devin's book. I don't know if it changed much. Um, uh, <laughs> but Alicia alluded to it too, and I was kind of curious about this, the religious aspect of all of this, especially how it relates to the concept that is of common humanity. So he talks about, about, a lot about equality, a lot about race, less about common humanity. And if you look at Dutch Enlightenment discourses, you see a lot of, you know, the point making like we are all, God has put us here, like we, we all come from Adam and Eve, so clearly we are all <laughs> from the same mankind. Uh, so I was kind of wondering how that plays into the debates that you are studying in this book. Yeah, excellent, Th thanks. I think, um, in, in, in interesting ways in the sense that uh, it was the fact that this, this, the, gen, the story of Genesis was increasingly rejected as, as lit, literal human history by Enlightenment thinkers. Uh, uh, not all of them, of course. Uh, you know, as we've uh, heard, there were many religious ones who, although even then, you know, we have to remember that 
uh, there are different shades of religiosity such that some of them took it literally and many others remained Christians but did not think that it was the actual history of humanity. But it was, it was of course the questioning of this as the actual history that opened up the space for uh, polygenism, so the idea that human beings might have distinct origins, which could again be both uh, uh, racist, but also not. It didn't necessarily have to be have to be racist. Um, but I think that um, uh, uh, what is interesting is that uh, a religious discourse could be put to egalitarian and non egalitarian purposes, just like an atheistic discourse. So that is what is so striking about uh, the Enlightenment. Is despite some scholars' best efforts to sort of make it about one or the other. So if you were an atheist, then you were obviously an egalitarian thinker, uh, you know, or if you were a Christian, then you were obviously inegalitarian it's not it's not so so simple as that um, but what is interesting I think is that most fundamentally is that once um, you know the question is not about how do we fit the, all of the peoples of the world into the story of Genesis uh, uh, then a whole new array of issues comes up ie how do we explain difference which you know, it gets placed on a new footing once uh, scholars start to investigate the mechanism of reproduction, new studies are done about heredity, and all of this is sort of, you know, you see how the politics of, of, of religion come in always. So in terms of uh, defending uh, 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 epigenesis or, or not, so the idea that, um, or preformationism rather, so preformationism meaning that the uh, uh, human being exists preformed uh, in the in the egg uh, or the sperm cell. That this was in line with uh, a biblical worldview, um, but this becomes questioned and, and therefore opens up the space for thinking in new ways about uh, human diversity. Yeah. So thanks. Yeah. Any more? We still have more time. <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, Ido Dan, um, Utrecht University. Uh, I, I have a question, um, first of all, for Devin. I, it's a question I asked before and didn't get a very satisfactory answer, perhaps now. So, um, <laughs> No pressure, Devin. No pressure. <laughs> so, um, you talk about um, uh, politicization. <laughs> Um, and in uh, most accounts of politicization, that's a process of denaturalization. Yeah? So uh, things become movable, become less fixed. Yet it seems in, the, in your story something very different is happening in the sense that it is naturalization of differences that allows a certain perspective of action. Uh, seeing things that, uh, although are fixed, can be changed. So first of all, I want you to, to reflect a bit on how, that, how you think about that. But then secondly, I was, I was of course triggered by first of you mentioning this geneticist that David Reich, I, I googled him, <laughs> I don't know. And I was then curious to, to know why Amada Masharek does not want to talk about him. So <laughs> what's the naturalization that attracts you so much in the work of David Reich that apparently you think allows you to think about relevant political action? Yeah, uh, well, it's okay. So for politicization, I guess it's um, and naturalization. I think that perhaps it's, it's a way, um, it, if we understand the naturalization of humanity as being Put, I mean, the idea that human beings are animals is an ancient idea, of course, but what happens, and, and part of nature, but what happens, of course, is that with the rise of a materialism, and especially the, you know, uh, materialism on a new footing, really the mathematization of, of, of the worldview that happens in the 17th century, uh, this, this idea of human beings as being part of nature takes on uh, 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 a, a, it gets placed on a new footing, I tried to show, because of the fact that, you know, explanations of, of for example, the differences between uh, skin color. It had, in the ancient world, of course, it was uh, conceived as a, an effect of the climate. But the idea, the, the rainy idea, was that this would happen re relatively quickly, that human beings would change uh, uh, in the way that they look uh, uh, within the, a matter of a couple of generations. But with the f migration, both forced and voluntary, of, of people 
uh, across the, the globe in the early modern period, especially by the 18th century, this is called into question. And um, uh, that, together with new investigations into heredity, I tried to show that, um, um, that, that you know, that there are that these are not as uh, uh, fluid categories as people had thought, um, but I think the the key here is that that inequality was not yet naturalized in the sense that uh, for for many of these thinkers that I that I look at, so e even though these people do there is a, an incredible physical diversity of humanity across the globe, and that does come from nature. Uh, uh, culture and intellectual production is something very much different from physical diversity. So, so that, that is what I tried to show, so that there, there is a, the politicization of equality in the sense that uh, uh, intellect and cultural production comes from, not from anything, uh, you know, uh, uh, physically rooted, such that, you know, people, non-white peoples can produce complicated philosophical works and beautiful works of art. That this reigns supreme in the 18th century. For example, uh, Helvetius, one of the main, Claude Adrien Helvetius, one of the main French philosophers says, uh, uh, there is no climate or skin color of people that is connected to either superiority or inferiority. He says that going from um, St. Petersburg down to Johannesburg, uh, people have been su successively stupid and enlightened. It's just a question of uh, culture, so uh, what we would call culture. Uh, so that, that's what I sort of tried to show is that, that this is the naturalization in terms of physical diversity, but that doesn't mean that, uh, uh, does that, does that answer your question? Because I feel like, uh, since you were unsatisfied with my previous answer. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And David Reich, well, I mean, I think that I don't, I'm not an, an expert on, on this at all, but I, I was just struck by the discourse, and I'm curious also to hear Ahmad's uh, reflections on this, but when, uh, you know, he, he's done, um, uh, not just alone, but obviously with a huge team of, of geneticists, work on uh, ancient DNA. And, and uh, what I find so striking is that, you know, from the outset, some social, social scientists said, this work should not be done. And I, just because of the, the, the legacy, basically, of eugenics, uh, to put it quite simply. <laughs> but but I, I, and I think like th this is, uh, we should, you know, we shouldn't shy away from such work. I mean, only if, you know, you were to say that there is, if you were to connect physical diversity or DNA to the intellect, because that, then, then I think then you're on, well, tricky and ridiculous ground because you know, I agree with Elve Schiss that societies have an incredible diversity of, uh, you know, they go, they, there is no genetic, uh, uh, group genetic connection between intelligence and, and uh, uh, genetics. So, so what do you, find, you, you say you find it attractive in some ways, and apparently also in ways to think about agency. Oh, agency. Well, I mean, I meant more in, in destroying the racist argument that there is a pure race, whatever you take that race to be. His work shows that uh, uh, there, there, there have been constant mixings and dis displacements of peoples throughout history, such that even the people who built Stonehenge in England uh, 5,000 years ago were genetically very different from the contemporary, the present day English population. Uh, because there was a major displacement that happened a few hundred years after Stonehenge was built. So you see that, you know, to say that, you know, we're, for example, in England, let's say, uh, uh, English nationalists, we have been here forever. Well, that's not true. <laughs> uh, so, so that's what I mean, that it gives an agency to uh, uh, destroying the racist lie of, of a sort of pure race and connecting uh, any kind of physical uh, uh, features to intelligence which is just, to me, ridiculous, but yeah. Uh, yeah uh, I want to be very, very brief. There's a lot that I can say about uh, uh, genetics, and I'm, I, I mean, I really love the field. I think it's a very important field, and it's coming, uh, bringing us all sorts of interesting, I think we are resonating, which is good, <laughs> but not in this way. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I'll just keep it very short uh, and related to David Reich. Um, I think also among social scientists who are informed and also um, engaging with genetics, he has been very much admired. Uh, I've been actually in 
the lab of Esfante Peba, with whom he has been working. I spent half a year working there as well. So he's the guy who really started working on ancient DNA, and it started off there. And then David Reich and others came in. Um, and there is a lot to be learned from um, this genetic biological work as long as we um, keep the complexities that is not just in history but also in genetics there. So uh, there's a lot of interpretational work going on. And initially, so he has been admired, but, admired, but recently when he published his latest book, which is addressing a wider uh, uh, audience, it is there that he made an interesting connection so when I said, you know, in genetics, we see that race is introduced as a, as a category to chocolate maken van de data, you know, to make sense of data. Um, it is a social category that is introduced and, you know, tr um, uh, projected on the data. Um, but what David Reich did said is, uh, okay, you know, my data seems to match with the social categorizations out there, with the way that people self-identify. This might actually be an indication that biological race exists. Well, this is when the situation exploded. I remember very well, I came back from a conference on race and history and in, uh, uh, in Norway, and as I was sitting at the airport, the whole, you know, my email exploded because things, <laughs> and, uh, and it became a huge controversy and we've written a long uh, response to this. And it is precisely there, so where you want to map biological data on social categories and to claim, therefore, that biology, biological differences uh, exist. And I think he did this really to sell his book, and it was a stupid mistake. It was in his uh, conclusion uh, chapter as well as in his um, article in the um, New York Times, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, so the idea that there is a kind of science bashing going on, and uh, um, this might be far off, but really not actually in academia. There's a lot of interaction and working a collaboration also across disciplines. No, that's absolutely true. I think, I think that though that there is still uh, some level of distrust of the biological sciences, I mean, not, uh, and rightly so, but no, absolutely. But, but to the extent that we're sort of approaching Sokol, uh, the Alan Sokol affair, you know, 2.0. So uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, just Google Alan Sokol affair from the 1990s when an, uh, an article with absolutely ridiculous uh, conclusions, a uh, physicist purposely sent it into a, a humanities journal and got it published, even though it was riddled with errors. Uh, and, and so this is something that I think that I really, you do see this still sometimes happening. And so that's what I, what I have an allergy to. But of course, that doesn't mean that there isn't productive dialogue across the disciplines, because there absolutely is. And, and um, I wasn't aware of the specific, um, of, of, the, of the, the, the specifics of, his, of, of, of the controversy. But uh, uh, in general, it was just in the conclusion, I just tried to make a call for the importance of, of um, this kind of work, that it's not rejected out of hand just because it's, uh, uh, you know, of, of just because of the dark history of, of genetics. But, uh. I really like when, okay, uh, Q&As kind of come to an end on a very controversial, uh, <laughs> uh, controversial <laughs> note, you know, like people keep wanting to, want to keep talking. But a look at my watch tells me that it is precisely 25 seconds to drink a clock. So I think <laughs> I just want to, yeah, it's been extremely enjoyable and stimulating to be party to this discussion. I just want to thank all of our panelists, all of you, and to our, our live stream audience as well. And uh, I think I invite all of you to come and join us for a festive drink over there. And, but before that, can we just give uh, Sylvia, Alicia, Ahmad, and Devin, of course, a big round of applause.